Okay, so like we've done in the book of Daniel thus far from the beginning, we're going to do a quick little review with lots of test questions to see if y'all have been paying attention. And uh, it's the same questions. So well, it's really just testing your memory at this point. All right. So Michelle's firing off an answer already. Let's see if she's right. Um, the book of Daniel is said to be a record of time between 606 BC and 536 BC. Um, and we know this from the entrance into the book of Daniel, where Daniel des Daniel is described as being taken captive, taken captive to Babylon in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim. And Je Jehoiakim was the king of Judah. And anything that we know about Israel, we know that it was originally one kingdom, which was God's kingdom. That was 12 tribes, the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Jacob. But we see in Daniel that it's two kingdoms. What, what, are, the, what are the two kingdoms? Northern and Southern, that is correct. Mike, do you remember the name of the kingdoms? That is correct. Judah and Israel. Way to go, Mike. So the Northern Kingdom was Israel, and we've gone over this multiple times, 19 kings over an, an era of 250 years. And then Judah, which was 20, 20 kings, 30, 370 years and they were in the Babylonian captivity during this time. We talked about this before. This is a slide from Chuck Misler. Okay. Who was Nebuchadnezzar? And what do we know about Babylon? So, who was Nebuchadnezzar Michelle? Yeah. He was a king of? There we go. King of Babylon. No, it's... <laughs> And what do we know about the city of Babylon? Uh, it, was <laughs> it was massive, right? And this was like the first world headquarters. This was considered the first world conquest, so to speak, was done by Nebuchadnezzar at this point. Um, so the reason we read about Daniel, Daniel obviously was a prophet. And we see him as being examined before the king as smart and handsome and physically fit based upon some things that transpired with his diet and whatnot. But during this time, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and it's a crazy dream. And so he calls all the soothsayers, magicians, astrologers, and wise men and tell them okay so the question was what was unique about the king's request after his dream and shelly hit the nail on the head when she said that they needed to tell him the dream first and then interpret it and that's when there was a decree that went out and all these people were getting mass murdered until it came to daniel and he said that uh, to tell the king to give him time and that god gives answers and did god give the answer to Daniel, did they, did God give the answer to Daniel? Okay. And the dream was of a great big image, right? Big idol, so to speak. Well, the, uh, the image was made of different materials. Can you name one? Okay. Nice. Did somebody say bronze? All right. All right. We got lots of winners here. So yes, the image had a gold head, silver chest and arms, bronze belly and chest, iron legs, and then iron mixed with clay for feet and toes. <clears throat> what did the different metals represent? The gold was and his empire. His empire. So then would you say that they represented a specific time in history? Right. So each one of these segments, each one of the materials represents a certain time period with a king associated to it. And we know that because Daniel then shares the interpretation of the dream. Okay. After the interpretation of the dream, and it's perceived that it's several years later, Nebuchadnezzar decides to build something massive in the plain of Dura. 
What did he build and what was the command that he gave? He built a big statue and asked them to idol to worship it. Okay, he built a giant gold idol and he told everyone to worship it. Did everyone obey the king's command? Yes. Oh. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Way to go, Mike. He got them all right. Abednego. 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 Yeah, there we go. Put something in the fire. That's right. That's right. Okay. So then when we had talked about chapter four, we we raised a, raised a question on who was the author of chapter four and why? Why was that even a question? Who do you guys think wrote Daniel chapter four? Okay. All right. Everyone's on fire tonight. Everybody's got all the answers. It was Nebuchadnezzar. We believe it's Nebuchadnezzar based upon the content in it, especially when it says, I thought it good to declare to you the signs and wonders that the most high God has worked for me. And this is King Nebuchadnezzar speaking. Okay. So King Nebuchadnezzar has another dream and he shares his dream with all the magicians and the you know, soothsayers, uh, astrologers and Chaldeans. And none of them have an interpretation of the dream. And the dream was about this mighty tree and this tree reached into heaven, but the tree was cut down for a certain period of time. Right? So, Daniel's advice was, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity, right? Daniel provides an interpretation of what this vision meant. And the question is, did Nebuchadnezzar take Daniel's advice? No. no. Wrong <laughs> So, and, and you know what? We don't know. Maybe he did take the advice for a short period of time, but all of a sudden he became prideful and said, is this not this kingdom that I have made with my hands for my glory? And in that very moment, he becomes that, that beast of a creature that's wet with the dew of heaven and crawls around on his hands and, and hands and knees. And uh, that was for seven seasons. Um, and so we see after seven seasons, King Nebuchadnezzar gives, gives credit to the Most High. And really, it appears as though he repents. And he dies. And we see the entrance of his son, Belshazzar, not to be confused with Belteshazzar, which was the Babylonian name given to Daniel. But Nebuchadnezzar's son does something pretty bad. What did he do? What did, what did Bel... To Belshazzar do. Oh, he had that party. He had a party. But what yeah. was really bad about the party? What what the, 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 the Kool-Aid Kool was definitely a problem. It was a problem with the Kool-Aid, but what were they drinking out of? They took all the articles out of the temple that were reserved. They used the items that were to set aside by Moses for God's temple, his tabernacle, his people. And so yeah. something happens because of that. The writing is on the wall. The writing is on the wall. A hand, an image that was in the shape of a man's hand that wrote something on the wall. Mike, super bonus extra credit if you can remember what was written on the wall. The writing is on the wall. It was something similar to what a kid would say. Okay, Mini Mini Tico you Farson. Way to go. Sounds to me like a little kid waving his finger. Mini Mini Tico you Farson. So, after that we see that he's immediately killed, okay? And another king comes in his place, and that king is King Darius. And King Darius also loves Daniel. So this is the third king that's appointed Daniel to be the administrator of the kingdom, so to speak. And the people under King Darius don't like how he's, we'll call it showing favoritism because Daniel stands out. And so they decide to pass a law. And what was the law that they, they told King Nebuchadnezzar to pass? Yeah, or King, King Darius to pass? Sure, and King Barnabas has got to go. 
Nobody can worship any other God but the king for the next 30 days. And it was written by the Medes and the Persians of a law which never changes. Nope. Okay. They didn't abide by bowing to the idol. Okay. So now they set this new law, which says that you can't have any petition to any other God for 30 days. And how did Daniel respond to that? He, 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 didn't, he didn't like it. Daniel did what he always did. And that was open his windows and pray openly to the God of heaven. And the penalty for doing that, which this contrivance is that took place by these evil men, was to be what? Thrown into a, a lion's den. Way to go, Mike. Okay. You know. And... During that time in the lion's den, was Daniel eaten by the lions? No. Okay. But the other <laughs> How do we know that the lions were hungry? <laughs> That's right. The, the, all of the families of those individuals who passed the law were tossed into the lion's den and they were eaten before their bodies hit the ground. They were smoked. So that got us into what I would consider to be a little bit more of a comprehensive slash complicated chapter, which was Daniel's uh, visions, Daniel chapter seven, where we saw a lion with wings, a bear with three ribs in its mouth. Yep. Uh, a leopard, a four headed leopard with Eagle's wings and then a 10 hoarded beasts. Okay. What did, what did each one of those, beasts represent the tiger was the alexander the great yes so what would you consider each you're ahead of the game way to go in fact what do they represent four kingdoms. four kingdoms very good mike and it's an even better answer that you said kingdoms and not kings because it is eras of kingdoms so the first kingdom was babylon and we talked about Babylon and we, we talked a lot about how they have the lion all over the place. And then the second kingdom was Medo-Persia. And what was something that was really cool is the, is the Bible tells us that the bear was lifted up on one side more than the other, signifying that one kingdom was stronger than the other. And uh, the three ribs, I believe, was Egypt, Syria, uh uh, three nations, the Babylonians, the Lydians, and the Egyptians. And then the last beast that we talked about was the leopard. And Shelley hit the nail on the head that this is Alexander the Great's kingdom, but it was a four-headed beast. Why was it a four-headed beast? We're going to go back to that. Before we get to the answer to that, Name something that's unique about Alexander the Great. Name one thing. What was something that was different about him than all the other kings? He was very young. Was young. That's right. He died in his 30s. What else, what else did he do during the... the... Take over the whole entire area. The known world. Yeah. So this is the known world at that time. You're absolutely right. He was a world conqueror. So we see that the leopard is swift. It's got four eagle's wings. It's conquering super fast. But this particular leopard had four heads. And the four heads represented four kings. Because when Alexander the Great died, there's legends around this. But his last words are supposedly, give it to the strong. And he had four military generals. They split his kingdom up, even though it was all still the same kingdom into four different areas, and his four generals took power. Um, died at the age of 33. We talked about comparing Daniel's vision uh, in comparison to Nebuchadnezzar's vision. But one of the things that there, Daniel had accepted these, these images that were there. There wasn't much of an issue with them, according to him. And again, these were much before the time of these individuals even being there. But the last beast was the one that was frightening and terrible in his eyes, right? And there's many people that have come to the conclusion that this empire, this beast, 
is Rome and the Roman Empire. But the question then is left is, is this the last kingdom where we've already seen this play out in history? Or is this kingdom something that's yet to come, yet future in our time frame, our time period, maybe even our lifespan? So that brings us into the material that we have for tonight, which we're going to start in chapter eight. In the third year of the reign of the king Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, even unto me, Daniel, after which appeared unto me at first, and I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was in Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in a vision, I was by the river of Uli. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but the one was higher than the other, and the other... And the higher one came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will. We talked about, we did touch on this a little bit last week, but I cut it short. So, as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him uh, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from the hand. We talked about this a little bit last week. The ram with two horns was Medo-Persia. And this goat, or he-goat, as it said, with one horn was Alexander the Great in his kingdom. And he smoked Medo-Persia. Moving on into verse 8 through 14. Therefore, the male group, goat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down because of transgressions. An army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So we see, it's very easy to see that the goat was Alexander the Great and the four horns were the four empires that came out of Alexander the Great's kingdom. Remember, he had four heads, four generals. But we see a small horn that grew up in the midst of them. And the question that Bible scholars pose is, is this the Antichrist? Which we read about in one of our very first, actually the very first book that we read as a group was Revelation. And we know that there's going to come a time when this Antichrist will enter the scene and he will win the world over with peace. Everyone's going to love this guy. They're going to willingly take his mark to buy and sell. He's going to be a supporter of the Jews and help rebuild the temple. But then three and a half years into his reign, he's going to erect an image of himself and demand that we worship him. Yes. It's funny how all this stuff's starting to tie in, huh? So what's unique about this fourth beast is this statement right here that's highlighted. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host 
and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. That doesn't sound like an earthly characteristic of a man. That sounds like something, I think it's something demonic. But some people believe that this particular, and when I say some, a lot, a lot of people believe, and I, I think this is also um, a majority of Catholics believe this. There is a large group of sects that believe this as well, that this particular event has already transpired and it's over. And it was done by Antiochus IV, where he self-titled himself Epimenes. He came into the kingdom. He saw what the Jews were doing. He started slaughtering the holy people, which was the, the glorious land that was on the West. And he went into their temple, slaughtered a pig on their altar, which if you know the Jews, how the Jews feel about pork, it's a problem. And then erected an idol of Zeus in the temple. And many people say this event has already been fulfilled in history. The problems are Daniel mentions to us that he overtakes the world through peace. And this guy slaughtered everybody. Everybody. And this also was where we learned about Hanukkah. Judas Maccabeus of the Maccabean family saw what was going on in the temple. And when they, they erected this image of Zeus, they had enough. And so it took them three years to do. And Antiochus IV Epimenes, Antiochus Epimenes, erected that statue of Zeus on his birthday, which was December 25th. And three years later, on the date of his birthday, they overthrew Roman power and spent seven days cleansing the temple. That seven days is Hanukkah. And that is what the Jews are celebrating during that week during Christmas. There's a few legends that surround it. The reason why, I'm sorry, eight days. And the reason why it's unique is they have that eight, eight candle, eight legged candle stand where in the bible we read about a seven a seven level seven leveled candlestick it was eight because it took eight days to cleanse the temple they had only enough oil to burn for one day but the amount of oil that was there lasted for the full eight days so that they could go back to performing sacrifices they hold it as a miracle and this is recorded in the book of maccabees in the apocrypha okay so Moving on through chapter eight. When it happened, then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning that suddenly they stood before me, one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face on the ground, but he touched me and stood upright and said, look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of indignation, for at the appointed time, the end shall be. The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia, and the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between the eyes of the first king as for the broken horn, I'm sorry, the large horn that is between the eyes of the, is the first king. As for the broken horn and the four that stood in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. So what history records and what the Bible records are, are intensely accurate. But the Bible records them before the events happen. It's how we know that the author is outside of the time domain that we currently live in. That's what makes it miraculous, is that God is telling Daniel through angels what will happen in the future before the events happen. This is going to move on to that fourth kingdom. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise having fierce features who understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, 
but not by his own power. He shall destroy fear fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. And he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. And the vision of the evening and mornings, which was told, is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward, I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. What was unique about Nebuchadnezzar's image? This just popped in my mind. Do you remember what happened to the image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream? A stone that was cut without hands came down from heaven and struck the image on its feet and crushed it into pieces. And the pieces that remained covered the whole earth. It sure ties in right here if you think about it. Because that stone, I believe, is Jesus. But it could very well refer to his second coming, not his first. Our Bible tells us he is coming a second time. So, I go into great detail about Antiochus Pimenes. So, the question, again, that people say is that there's a lot of features that happen right here that expressly show this could be Antiochus Epimenes. Epimenes means the exalted one. That's the name he gave to himself. They called him Epiphanes, which means um, the madman. The Jews did a little wordplay, called him Epimenes instead of Epiphanes. So he took on the title as exalting himself as the holy one. He slaughtered a pig inside the temple. He erected uh, an image of Zeus inside the temple. And he was, we're going to continue on. So here's my answer to this. And anytime that I, I want to raise up a question with you guys, I want to do it with scripture. And what do we remember about words in red, love my love? It's Jesus speaking. Right? So this is Matthew chapter 24. This is when the disciples... The disciples are walking with Jesus and they say, oh my gosh, Jesus, look at this temple, how glorious it is. And Jesus says, the days are coming where not one stone will be left upon another. And they, they're, they're blown away. They're blown away that this is going to happen. And they ask him, what will be the sign of these things? What will be the sign of the end? They ask him three questions. They want to know when, when this item is going to happen, what the end of days is going to be like, and I, and I can't remember. I, there, there's another one that I'm forgetting. And so Jesus responds to them with this response. This is Jesus. Okay, so remember Daniel 606 BC. Jesus at this time, it's around 2880, several hundred years later. And it was in 270 BC that the Alexandrians got 70 scholars to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek because Greek was the common spoken language and it was precise. Those individuals, it took 70, it took 70 scholars to translate the Bible precisely from Hebrew into Greek. And that was called the Septuagint, which is a Greek word for 70. So all of the people of that day in the common spoken language would have known the words of Daniel not just Jesus, because we know Jesus is supernatural. So he's referencing Daniel in this scripture that's happening several hundred years later. Jesus says, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, and see that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. What was the beginning of sorrows, babe? I'm asking you for a specific reason. You're the only one who's in this position right now. The beginning of sorrows was a term that was used to describe labor pains. Labor pains. 
And what do we know about labor pains? <laughs> so we know two things about labor pains. When they start happening, they start to increase in frequency and duration. So this is a hint to us in the future. You may be looking out and seeing weather and people telling us this is a byproduct of climate change and trying to sell a different narrative than what's going on. This could actually be a sign that these things are going to happen more frequently. So, but these aren't the signs of the end. They're just a hint. So, and these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whomever reads this, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time, nor, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is Christ or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise to show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. We went and we, we talked about this one in pretty great detail when we went through Matthew. But I want you guys to notice one thing that I've highlighted here. It said, Jesus says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Jesus is talking to them about a future event. Antiochus Epiphanes had already happened. He had already erected years before this. What Jesus is talking about is a warning about things to come. We're given types throughout history. Look at Hitler. What was Hitler's goal? To wipe out the Jews. One in three Jews were killed because of Hitler. I think it's prophet, the prophet Zechariah says, and this, this time... Two out of every three will be killed during this time of great tribulation. And this is Old Testament prophets. So I think Antiochus Epimenes is an example or a type of this new world ruler that's going to be elected into position. And people are going to love him. And then sometime during his covenant that he has, or his seven-year term, three and a half years into it, he's going to erect an image of himself in the temple. And that is the abomination of desolation. And it's funny because Chuck Misler says, look, this is a technology statement. It says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, how many people were allowed in the temple? You remember? Once a year, nobody else was allowed in there. Chuck Misler points out, he goes, how is it that everyone's going to see the abomination of desolation? It's going to be on CNN. You're going to be able to see it on TV, what's going on. Because every eye will be able to see that. And that's a technology statement. You know what I mean? This is 30 ADs. 
2,700 years or uh, 2,070 years ago. So move on into Daniel chapter nine and Daniel chapter nine is a good one. I feel bad for whoever's missed. So in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of the lineage of the Medes, who was the king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Okay, what's happening right now? Do you guys do you guys know what Daniel was doing? He was reading his Bible and he was studying it intently and he read what the prophet Jeremiah wrote and said, Jeremiah is talking about a Babylonian captivity. We're going to be in Babylon for 70 years. Daniel was 13 when he got brought in as a captive in, in, into Babylon. He's been a captive for almost 70 years. He's in his 80s. He's perceived from reading his Bible that they're about to come out of captivity. So Chuck Misler points out and he goes, if you were reading your Bible one day and you discovered that Jesus Christ was going to come back to come back to this earth on Monday, what would you do? My question is, what would you guys do? Tell everyone. Tell everyone? Be praying. Okay. The majority of people who he talked to said, good, this place needs some cleaning up, right? But what did Daniel do? Exactly what you guys are saying. He went to prayer. And look at what Daniel says here. That was a really good answer, Shelly. It says where your heart is. It says, then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplications with fasting sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O oh Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and to all the people of the land. O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face as it is this day. To the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of of the land, O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but shame of faith oh, I, I read. to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and of Israel, those near and those afar off, all the countries to which you have driven them, because of the unfaithfulness which which unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O oh Lord, to us belong shame of face, to our kings, our princes, <clears throat> and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord. Our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he has set before us by the servants of prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven, such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of your land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city Jerusalem, your holy mountain. Because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear our prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. 
Oh my God, I oh, incline your ear to hear and open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. Oh Lord, hear. Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake. My God, for your city and your people are called by your name. So Daniel pours out his heart and tells, tells I mean, da Daniel is repenting of sins that we don't even know about. Because everything we've heard about Daniel thus far is he's an amazing character and he stands up for God, stands up for what's right. And God has blessed him in various areas. He's telling us that he sinned and the people have sinned. And he's pouring his heart out. And listen, listen to this. Now, while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, the holy mountain of God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to swive, fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel. I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, the consider the matter and understand the vision. Okay. Who are the three archangels? That's true. You guys... Come on, I, I someone's got to know the next one, especially in the Spadafor family. Yes, Michael. Do you guys know the third? Um, start to the E. Nope. <laughs> well, unless that's Adam. Watch, watch this. Adam knows them all. Third, third archangel. Adam was the name of the archangel. Uh, Michael. Obviously, everybody knows that one. You have Michael, Michelangelo. And then the second one is... It's Black Brother. Uh, I know, I'm trying to think. What's his fucking... Uh, Amenadil. Amenadil, okay. Keep, you... Lucifer, Amenadil, and uh, Michael. Did you get close? Yeah, so it's Lucer, no. Lucifer. I told you I started Gabriel, with you. Amenadil. And Michael. I don't know about Amenadil. Oh, okay. <laughs> he was the son of the morning. Yeah, he was... Uh, we believe that Lucifer was in charge of worship in heaven. And then he wanted to take on worship for himself. There's one of the prophets that talks about why he was cast down from heaven. So, and, and you can see that Satan consistently tries to mirror what God does with Christ. This, we have an antichrist. I think he's going to be like Christ in every way. My cousin Christopher and I have gone down the rabbit hole where we've thought about like, what is, what is the wildest way that you could make someone the antichrist if that's deceiving? So the, I believe it's the Catholics that have something called the Shroud of Turin. And the Shroud of Turin is supposedly the wrapping that went around Jesus's face that was left in the tomb. They believe that they have it. And it, you can see the image of that's left imprinted with the blood and stuff like that. It's left an image. How much more of a false Christ or antichrist could you make if you took a blood sample from that and created a clone. We've cloned Jesus. We found his blood and we've made an exact copy. What would you do? How would the world respond to that? Run, and pray. Uh -huh. run to him. But would that be Christ? No. I didn't say run to him. I would run and pray. <laughs> yeah, run away. Run, run away and pray. All right, that's different. <laughs> run away. Okay, so we see Gabriel here. Um, Gabriel, this is a Chuck Smith thing. Chuck Smith had mentioned that it seems as though Gabriel is the one who gives messages about the future and about the Messiah. He's always the message, the messenger, so to speak, the, the message giver. He was Gabriel who told Mary that she was going to have a baby. And I believe it was Gabriel who visited with, um, Elizabeth's husband when she gave, when she was pregnant and going to have birth in her old age. So this is one of the most talked about sections out of the Bible when it comes to prophecy is these, I think it's these next three verses. Okay. 
because Gabriel gives him a vision about time and it's about all time. So 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. There shall be, the street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation, which is determined is poured out on the desolate. This scripture right here plagued Sir Robert Anderson of the Scotland Yard because he believed they could mathematically figure out the time frame that's talked about here. If Jesus was the Messiah, they had an idea because the Bible records when the temple was rebuilt. Secular calendars record when the temple was rebuilt and the street was rebuilt. Both of them do. It took place on 445 BC, April 1st, the first month of the San. King Artaxerxes Longimanus gave the decree to Nehemiah to go and rebuild the temple. So the question then becomes, how long is 62 plus 7 weeks? 69 weeks. And this guy figured it out. 10 years, he found out that the ancient calendar, calendar before we got into the Gregorian calendar that we know now consisted of only 360 days. And all of the calendars did that until this one point in history that there's not much talked about where Chuck Misler and the very various astronomers have discovered that Earth and Mars had a near miss with each other during the lifespan of human on hum, humanity on Earth. And that's when the magnetism changed in which we gained days. And then we have a leap year and we have this one. So we have a difference in days. It all transpired on one day. But before then, it was always 360 day years. So the Jews work in weeks of years. Remember when Jacob served for Rachel, but he was tricked and was given the older, uglier sister when he really was working for seven years. He fulfilled his week. He worked for seven years for this beautiful girl from her, her worked for her father for seven years. And on his wedding day, he wakes up in the morning and the father says, oh yeah, we don't give the uh, younger before the older. So he had to serve another seven years <laughs> to go after his the woman that he really wanted was Rachel. So you had Rachel and Leah, but it talks about that he fulfilled his week. So if you take 69 weeks of years and you factor in all these days, 360 days, you get 173,880 days. What this guy did is he knew the date in which King Artaxerxes Longimanus gave the decree and spent little over a decade calculating with astronomers because we have some weird changes that happen in the calendars on what 173,880 days led to from the going forth of building the temple. And so I'm going to take you guys to that right now. This is cool. Are you guys seeing this website right here on the screen? Let me do a new share. Can you see it now? Oh, you guys. No, I'm sharing this screen. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to read this for you real quick. This is something off of Chuck Misler's website. 
And I just, I want to read it straight so I don't mess up anything. Um, Daniel 9, verse 24, it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make a reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. The idiom of a week of years was common in Israel as for a Sabbath for the land in which the land was to lie fallow every seventh year. It was their failure to obey these laws that led to God sending them into captivity under the Babylonians. Note that the focus of the passage is upon thy people and upon thy holy city. That is upon Israel and Jerusalem. It's not directed at the church. The scope of this prophecy includes a broad list of things which clearly have have yet to be completed. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build the the, the and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, and the street shall be built again in the wall. This includes a mathematical prophecy, as we have noted in previous articles. The Jewish and Babylonian calendars use a 360-day year, 69 weeks of 360-day years equals 173,880 days. In effect, Gabriel told Daniel that the interval would be between the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem until the presentation of the Messiah, the king, would be exactly 173,880 days. The Messiah, the prince, in the King's James, King James translation is actually the Messiah Nagid. Messiah Nagid, the Messiah, the king. Nagid is first used for King Saul. The commandment to restore the building the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem was given by Artaxerxes Longimanus on March 14th, 445 BC. The emphasis in this verse on the street and the wall was to avoid confusion with earlier mandates confined to rebuilding the temple. <clears throat> During the ministry of Jesus Christ, there were several occasions in which people attempted to promote him as king, but he carefully avoided it by saying, my hour has not yet come. You guys remember that? When he would say, my hour has not yet come? Okay, we can we can review those. So then one day, Jesus meticulously arranges this. On this particular day, he rode into the city of Jerusalem riding on a donkey, deliberately fulfilling a prophecy by Zechariah that the Messiah would present himself as a king in just that way. Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass and upon the cult of the foal of an ass. Whenever we might easily miss the significance of what is going on, the Pharisees come to our rescue. They felt that the overzealous crowd was blaspheming, proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah, the King. However, Jesus endorsed it. We know that because they told Jesus to tell your, your disciples to stop saying this. And Jesus said, I tell you that if I should tell them to hold their peace, that these stones would immediately cry out. Speaking of the rocks, and we, we went over that. This is the only occasion that Jesus presented himself as a king, and it occurred on April 6th, 32 AD. When we examine the time period between March 14th, 445 BC, and April 6th, 32 AD, and correct for leap years, we discover that this is 173,880 days. Do you see the correlation there? The angel Gabriel visited Daniel around 500 BC. He gave him a prophecy that when the order was given to go and rebuild the temple and the street, there would be 69 weeks of years until the Messiah, the, the king, would present himself as the Messiah. 300 years later, King Artaxerxes Longimanus gives a decree. 69 weeks of years later, 173,880 days, Jesus rides in on a donkey, presents himself as the Messiah, the king. What do we know about Jesus? He's killed on a cross. But did he die for himself? He died for others. And remember, and this whole prophecy about Daniel, 600 years before this event happens, is given by the angel Gabriel. And we know that the Messiah was cut off, but not for himself. Yeah. So, yes. Is it when Jesus rode on the donkey into town on Sunday? No, Good Friday. Um, That's what they call it, Good Friday. But we can talk about that in more in more depth later, son. Okay. Let's go back to 
this one here. So that's going to bring us into chapter 10. And chapter 10, I'm going to tell you guys right now, chapter 10 and 11 was very, uh, it's already seven o'clock. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's fine. Yes, it is. So we're going to read chapter 10 and 11 and 12 next week. We're going to do all three chapters. We'll finish the book of Daniel. And um, I think next week, I want everyone to think about what book they want to read next, because we will be done with the book of Daniel. Uh, it finishes at chapter 12. But strongly consider, read this, read this section, guys. Read 10 and 11 and 12 and, and consider it. But... I'll close this off there and let's stop. Oh, okay.